So not only is he mindful of the connectivity that happens in these type forums, he has a he has a history and bio that you can read on your own, but I'm gonna give some of the things that he has touched in his time. So who we have up before is Chief Master Sergeant LeVar Kirkpatrick retired. He served as the command chief of the 17th training wing as a principal advisor of the quality of life, mission growth, and instructional a resiliency of 2.1 square miles for the military training base with a population of 5.9 thousand military members. Partners with civic leaders appointed and elected to improve the, the civilian and military relationship between the city of San Angelos and Goodfellow Air Force Base, which provided 1.2 billion economic impact each year. And dear to his heart, motivating, inspiring 14,000 students each year attending the intelligence training in DOD fire, fire, I'm sorry, fire training. Ladies and gentlemen, please brace yourself for Chief Kurt Patrick. <laughs> Thank you. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that, uh, that, that bio in, in some time. I was, I was uh, I laughing because uh, 17 Training Wing, for those of you who, who don't know who, uh, uh, your chief master sergeant of the Air Force um, was there. You know, if you ever had a job and you were, uh, and you knew you were not the best person at that job, it's going there to be the command chief of the 17th training wing just two cycles after the chief, ma after Chief Bass. Uh, I kid you not, I got there and every airman, NCO, or whatever I met, they were like, oh, Chief KP, you're great, but man, Chief Bass, oh my God. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Hey, so um, if I can, I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about the strategic competition and how it relates to you. Now, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than many of you have already been exposed to this stuff. A lot of you guys know this. Hell, a lot of you guys can come up here and do like an in-depth uh, threat briefing based on your theaters. Um, and, and, and recognizing that when we talk strategic competition, it's not s simply one thing. It's a lot of different things. But I heard it said a few different ways today, and that's what, kind of what I want to focus on. I heard the, um, the, actually it started very, very early. I think um, uh, Chief Heaton said it. I, I can't remember, forgive me if I credit the wrong person. But this morning it was, um, when you think about competition, you need to recognize we're talking about, oh, it was about thinking about China. When we think about China, you know, how many of you have fought to, tr have already fought China or have already fought Russia? Who did I, who did I give credit? Was that you, Chief, Chief K, BK? My, my bad. But it was, that was it. And then when you listen to what Chief Bass uh, said this morning, and she spoke about competition, and she kept in this thread of, we need to think differently. And then the chief, when he spoke, he was very, very clear. We need to think differently, as particularly when you talk about the competition thread, and it's about thinking. So what I'm going to try to do just for a little bit of time with you guys today is I want to talk about strategic competition, not necessarily just in terms of the, the threats and the challenges that we have, because that's absolutely true, but I kind of want to give a bit of a framework, a concept for how we can think about it differently. Because if you think about it differently, you can understand what, what we're dealing with, and when you think differently, then you can communicate to your airmen exactly what's going on. So when I hear strategic competition, it's about how we think, and so that's what I want to uh, shape the, the conversation around. And I want to shape it around how you think about these two basic things, and those are the two words that are at the root of that, strategy and competition. How do you think about competition, and how do you think about strategy, and we'll go into each of those here a little bit. And then after that, I really just want to have a conversation with you, and let's just go back and forth talking about what the challenges we face as, as a nation are. And I will be at the geo, geo strategic level. Let's talk. Let's elevate our thinking up front. Just recognize, I'm not going to get down into the weeds with you on the day-to-day the, the, the -day minutia of what you do. Let's take a moment and go geostrategic. Let's talk about America. Can we do that? Right, because, hey, that's what it's about. It's about America, right? At the end of the day, your purpose is to defend America, and that's of the utmost importance to me. So let's talk about how we defend America through this construct of strategic competition. So strategy and competition. Competition being on the continuum of war. War, conflict, competition. All of those are in the same continuum according to the joint doctrine. So if you have this, this basic conti this continuum of war, I want to recognize first, you're warriors. So talking about war should not concern you. You shouldn't have, you should be all about it. Let's talk about war because that's what I want to actually start the competition discussion with is war. What is war? 
Oddly enough, after 20 some odd years in the Air Force as a military member, it was not until I had the distinct honor to go um, uh, spend some time at the Air War College where I was actually exposed to how do we as, a, as an Air Force talk about and train our officers to understand war. And there is pr primarily thinking that comes from these two areas, from this uh, great thinker. How many of you are familiar with Carl von Clausewitz? All right, see, at the end of this year, the, the, the hands are going to go up because I'm talking Clausewitzian theory. So we're going to talk about Clausewitz because he provides a definition of war that is pivotal to how most of the Western world views war fighting, which goes all the way through the concepts of conflict and competition. So we're going to use Clausewitz and his theories to give us a baseline for thinking on war for competition's sake. All right? So here's what it is. Clausewitz view describes war as this. It is policy, it is, I'm sorry, war is politics by other means. Essentially what he's saying here is war is a political objective that a state is trying to achieve. In order to achieve that, they have certain mechanisms that they use. One of those mechanisms is violence. Violence is on the continuum of war, and so he's essentially saying that in order to achieve a objective, you have uh, a state has the option to use war, if you will, all the way up until the point to meet that objective. Stated another way is this. War is always about trying to achieve a political objective. Does, does that make sense? All right. Because of that, we as a military have to understand that you can win every battle and still lose the war if you do not hit your political objective, if you do not achieve what your state was trying to achieve. That is baseline for that understanding of what war is. Make sense? All right, too easy. So this is Karl von Clausewitz's approach. I'm not going to bring the next one up, but let's th take, uh, take, a, um, take a moment and think about how our adversaries of the great challenge that we're considering tends to think about war. And the thinker on their end is who? Sun Tzu. And Sun Tzu defines war very similarly, but there's a few distinctions in how Sun Tzu looks at war. And here's the two prime things that stand out for Sun Tzu's definition of war, and they are this. Deception is key. Remember that. Deception is essential in war. And the other aspect of, of Sun Tzu's definition as, as they describe war is the ability to change the will is to, is to defeat your enemy's will without the use of violence. It's a prime tenet. They're trying its hardest to, to destroy your enemy's will without the use of violence. Mind you, when they do talk violence, it's about total destruction, just FYI. Sun Tzu's definition of, of war, when you actually get into the war fighting portion, is about destruction of your enemy. It is not truly about reaching a political objective. But the political objective aspect of it is simply do everything you can to destroy their will prior to the onset of violence. Once you start violence, it's about complete destruction. Does, does that make sense? So if you have that context, how, they, how Sun Tzu views, which, is, which informs a lot of Chinese thinking about war and competition, and then how the US or, and our Western allies view competition and conflict, you, you can almost potentially see that there's going to be a bit of a, a dilemma in terms of how each of us sees conflict. But first, again, I just want to give you this basic premise that from Clausewitzian standpoint and the rest of our conversation here, if this first part is going to be all Clausewitz, is going to focus on this. It's about trying to achieve a political objective by whatever means you have possible, right? So in order to do that, Clausewitz gives this construct here. And he says this, success in war is based on your ability to balance what's called the paradoxical trinity. The paradoxical trinity has these three entities. Your policy of the government, what the government wants to achieve, the might or the skill of the military, also known as chance, that's the ability to operate in the unknown, and the skill, that's what your military, your generals, your thinkers do. And then the other one is the passion of the people. What is the skill, the talent, and the, pa and, and the people? What matters to them? If in the, in the construct of the paradoxical trinity, all three of those things have to be, are interdependent, and they have to be strong in order for them 
to achieve the objective that a state wants to achieve. If you are weak in one or two of those areas, it's implied that you will not meet your political objective. Does that make sense? So let's walk through that real quick. Policy. Now, I want to focus kind of on us first and foremost. What is our national overarching policy, geopolitical policy? What matters to America? And if it's free, uh, you don't have to go to the thing. Just say it back out to me. What matters to America? Say that? America. America. Uh, that's right. America matters to America. American, American interests. What, matter, what matters to us? America. Say that? Our economy. Freedom. What? Somebody said, so, said democracy? Hell yeah. What else? Influence. So, what was that other one? Global influence. All right? So America's policy is based around uh, most of what you just said. America's national policy is based around this idea of fr a free market and protecting the global commons. If you protect the global commons, that allows us to have free trade. We rely on free trade because that's how our economy functions and that's where we gain most of our power and freedom is having access to the global commons. So you will see when you look at na national strategic foundational documents that Chief Bass mentioned earlier, you will see generally at the top there's a thread in there that is going to always point back to this idea of our requirement to defend, first of all, defend the homeland. You guys know that as baseline. The other one is defend democracy worldwide and ensure, that, uh, and ensure or try to protect, here's the, here's the kind of buzzword that, uh, that describes this whole thing, protection of the current international order. Right? What is the current international order or the world order? And that's where we talk about the global commons, the ability to diverse in, in the global commons, those being you know, sea, space, cyber, the places that you have a general area that you can communicate back and forth with. So that's, our, that's America's national policy, right? I had a, I want to make sure I covered everything else. All right, so in, in order to achieve your policy, you have certain instruments uh, of power that you use. We know these, dime. In order to, to work that, do not find yourself or any state thinking that you only have one instrument. Sometimes because we are the military instrument, we think in terms of the military, it, it, it's not, power doesn't work like that. You have all of the in instruments to apply. So you guys know this, you're professionals at this, but here's one of the most important things about policy. Please put this in the back of your, <laughs> your head for your national policy. Stability is key. Changing and shifting policy is, the, is where we begin to lose ground when your policy shifts so much. Now, what I just described, what we talked about briefly as policy, those are not things that have changed. Those are longstanding national policy. But it's important to note that when you talk in government policy, stability is key. And the other thing about uh, the government and policy that's important is that a, num a government's number one goal is survivability of that government. I don't know if you realize that, but our government is the same way and every other state's number one objective, its prime, is survival of the, of the administration or the government that's in play, right? So survivability and consistency and stability is gonna be key in terms of policy. So I'm focused a lot on us because we're gonna take a minute and we're gonna talk about them, but let's get through us first. So, Clausewitz, Clausewitz gives you this idea of government policy. They are the ones who set the objective. And then on the other hand, he describes what's called the people. It's important to note that government and people are not the same thing. That's why I remind you of January 6th, because the people and the government do not always agree. And that's, and that's something that is, um, we see it play out all over the world all the time. People are different than the governments for which that represent them. And it's important to recognize the power of and the influence of those people. So when you look at people, or when you look at people, what Clausewitz is referring to here is the will of the people. You cannot go into a war or conflict and not have the will of the people to support you. If, they, if you do not have their, if, if, you don't, if they don't have the will to support it, you're not gonna get the things that you need in order to accomplish it, which goes into what Chief Bass has been begging us to, to focus on, 
which is resources. You know, if the people don't care, you'll never get the resources you need because the people are the very, pe are the very ones that supply the resources required. So how do you influence will? How do you influence will of a people? Let's talk. Say that. Messaging. Messaging. Perfect. How, how else? How do you influence a nation's will or the will of the people broadly? Because it's, it's in there in what you said, but I would just pull it out just a little bit even more. Fear. Say that. Fear. fear is a powerful tool. How do you, how do you use fear then? So you say, say that through actions? Okay, and you said? Control markets through fear, all right. What else? You said self-interest? I heard something else. Say, say that again? Yes. Yeah, you, you, you were like, you knew what I wanted to hear. How many of you figured out he's just trying to get you to say media? Because it is. At the end of the day, it's about information. If you want to influence the will of a people, it's the information that they get. And you control the information through the media that they take in. So in America, we have free press, free media. Guess what? Our will is completely informed by the information that our people receive. Completely. And so the will of the American people is completely responsive to the kinds of information that we get and that we receive uh, through media, through social media, through information, through misinformation, all of it is equally powerful in determining the will of the people that you find yourself responsible for. So that's what Clausewitz describes as that. I, I don't know if you see, I'm, we're laying some breadcrumbs to see what the problems are. You guys, ho hopefully we're walking the same direction. All right, so the next one on that trinity that he describes is this idea of chance, but then he refers to it as military. So what this refers to is that on the Trinity, you have two things so far that we've discussed. Policy, what does the government want to try to accomplish? What is the overall objective? Hopefully it's stable. The other thing is the people. Do the people support it? Are they interested? Do they support the outcomes of what the government wants to achieve? And then you have this idea of chance or the military, which recognizes that there are always unknowns. There's things that you don't know, and there has to be some form of skilled and talented group of individuals with tools and capabilities that will go after trying to solve whatever that problem is. And that is where the military comes in. We are the ones that deal in the fog of what he calls fog of war. And the way Clausewitz describes it, the fog of war, the military, the, uh, he actually uses uh, the army is the term that he used based on his time as a Prussian in the 1700s. But he refers to it as the army. But what we're talking about there is the fog of war and the generals, their ability to adapt to change and to think and to operate with less than perfect information. If you can do that, then you are effective as a military. So I want to just take a moment and plant ourselves right there just for a second. You've heard it said here so many times today, at least this has stood out to me, that we need to be a thinking force. We need to be a thinking force. When you look at the military and our potential success in whatever challenge we have in front of us, we have to be agile, highly skilled, and we have to be a, a thinking force. Whatever, the fact that you're away from your section, your home units for the next four days is the, and it's not cheap for you to be here. I know many of you are like, well, I didn't get the chance to rent a car, blah, 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 the government's being cheap. This is not a low cost endeavor for all of you to be here for the time that you are here. This is a significant investment. And one of the things that you heard the chief say and the chief say that we want you to take this time to think. Think about what you've done. Think about your experiences. Think about how you can do things better than before. Because how many of you have been through enlisted PME? I know, it's a silly question, right? All right, how many of you have been through officer PME? Couple, a couple of us. So here was what I learned in officer PME when I had a chance to do IDE uh, and SDE. It was this. They took a year of their lives away from work, from everything else, and we went to school. And we learned, and we thought, 
and we debated and we engaged in military thinking and we talked to strategy and we try and tried to develop better ways to do things because we had a break to think when I had a chance to do officer PME. You know what we did in enlisted PME? You guys know, we got after it. We went in, we were there, we freaking did class for eight hour days nonstop because and officer PME, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but we were doing half days. Is that, is that, is that, a, is that a secret? I don't know. But we was, but if it was like, if it was 1230 and you were still in the building, it was like a problem. Like something had gone horribly wrong if you were still in the building at 1230. All right. So, but, but what I'm saying is, is man, you're getting after it. And you know what, what's happening while you're at PME? Your airmen, your NCOs and so forth, you're still responsible for them, aren't you? So I, I know they try to tell you, no, you need to focus on this. Well, you get a unit, hey, Sergeant so-and-so done messed up. Uh, you get that call, you're like, damn, I got to go handle this. And then you got to get back to writing a paper, doing briefings, and doing all of the things that we were doing in PME. Here's how I always viewed it. From the moment you joined, you, you took the oath of enlistment as an enlisted member, you were on a hamster wheel. And we have been running your ass for 20 plus years. We have not given you a break. Your officer teammates, every once in a while, they run, they get a break, they get a staff job. They post up for a staff job for a couple years or they go to school. You ever wonder why when a new commander shows up, oh, they're like on fire. <laughs> you know, they get in there like a kid, they're like, oh my God, new commander, and they just want to do stuff. And they got two years. And what did they do for two years? They run hard for two years. And then the next commander comes in, and guess what they do? They run hard for two years. You know why? Because they, chances are, particularly at certain levels, they're either just coming off of staff or command or somewhere else where they had time to stop, take a break, think about what they wanted to do next, reflect on these things, and then they jump back in and then go after it. You know what you were doing. You know what you're asking your people to do. I'm not saying that we have the, the immediate solution for that right now, but I can tell you this, if we take the moment to give you a, a moment, a break to stop and try to reflect and think, let's take the time to do that. Let's really take the time to stop and think and reflect so we can try to help solve some of the bigger problems that we find ourselves facing. And that's, that's a big part of what I think is going to be and make us successful going forward is actually taking the time to think strategically. So here's the other th thing on thinking, because I'm still on thinking for military is um, it's been mentioned. How many of you think about the second and third order effects of actions? All right, how many of you take actions deliberately to achieve those second and third order effects? Because that's, that's, that's a key thing there, is to do it knowing that maybe this immediate effect, I know what this is, but I'm actually trying to get to that other effect. I'll give you one other way you can try to get there just through conceptual thinking alone, is this. When you hit an organization in your unit, I want, I want to challenge you to think strategically in this way. Try to solve problems that are not just two years out or one year out. Chief Bass has been talking about 2030. Think about solving the 2030 problem. Think about what you can do today that impacts 2030, how the way that you do your PT or the way that you develop your, your airmen or, or the way that you are mentoring these chiefs is going to prime them for 2030. Think beyond the immediacy of the moment and trying to solve something that can get on your EPR in the next five minutes and actually take the time to think about what is the big problem that's five to ten years out and can I do my part to take steps in trying to get there? If you do that, you'll find yourself naturally beginning to think more strategically, and you'll start taking actions with the second and third order effects as the primary outcomes of what you're trying to achieve. And that, that's a big portion for thinking strategically. The last one on thinking I just think is this, is man, try to solve your boss's boss's problem. From thinking strategic, just try to solve your boss. So, you know, you have your, if you're squadron, if you're at a squadron level, and your squad and the commander's got a pro got it, sir or ma'am. I'm gonna help you try to solve that. You also need to be thinking about the group or the wing or the organization up, trying to solve those problems, or recognizing the context of the issue you're 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 trying to get after in the context of the broader problem at, that's at hand. Try to solve that next level. Uh, finally, on, on the military side, 
is uh, I have, I've always had this belief that, man, you have a responsibility to develop the future. That's already been said, right? If you want to develop the future, you have to consider at least two, two basic factors. Because when I say the future, you're talking about the airmen of the future. You need to think about or know what the tools that they're going to have at their disposal and the environment that they're going to be functioning in. The tools and the environment. You should know the tools and the environment because those are the things that determine the warrior that you need for tomorrow. If we all were in, if we lived in Spartan era and we were Spartans, what were the tools that we would have? Spears and shields and swords. So what would be the, what would be the training that I would have to give you or what would be the, the, the talent that I would need you to have to function in that, in that environment? It would be different than it is today. I would need you to have strong leg, you'd have to have strong upper body, leg power. You'd have to be someone who was, um, I guess, fearless in terms of their ability to uh, follow orders and to connect to, to their teammates in a, a very physical manner. You'd have to meet certain physical uh, requirements in terms of height and build to be an effective warrior. And that was not just because it was cool at the time, it was because of the tools that they had and the environment for which they were prepared to fight in. So that's how they designed themselves to be a warrior culture. So as tools evolve, so will evolve the requirements of the warriors themselves. Think about the tools that are coming online, cyber, AI. Think about the different environments that we find ourselves working in. Think about the, those challenges. And now as you're developing your airmen, what are the things we need to do to build them for that environment? And it's OK if they don't look like you, because your environment and their environment will be different. That's OK. So if the military functions, and if, it, if, it, if we can do that, if we can think this way, if we have that agility, if we're led in this way, we can respond to the unknown. And that's what chance is. That's what, um, that's what he's talking about when he describes this concept of chance. Does that make sense? All right, so the, the other one, so that's competition, war. Just breaking down war in terms of the paradoxical trinity knows three different forces. This next one is this idea of um, strategy, because that's, you know, strategic. And strategy. So it's generally accepted, um, and I, I say generally accepted because it's still somewhat debated, but when you think about strategy in its most basic terms, it's this. It is ends, ways, and means. Ends being what it is that you hope to achieve. Ways, how are you going to achieve it? And means, what are the resources that you are going to have in order to achieve it? Now, I've heard uh, General Brown say this, and if many of you have heard, a lot of people hate the word strategy. They're like, that's not strategy. This is not strategy. This is blah, blah, blah. This is a bunch of BS. That's not, that's not strategy. Here's where I think a lot of this comes from. The national defense strategy, national security strategy. You guys have read those documents? At least the summaries, right? And we got a new national defense strategy coming up. I want to encourage you to read it as well. Those documents are not the totality of strategy. Those documents reflect the ends and ways of what we're trying to accomplish. They define what the environment is, and they tell you how we, we can get there, broadly speaking. They do not generally get into the specific resource requirement to get after it. Where does the resource requirement come from? It's from that other thing that Chief Bass was talking about, which is the National Defense Authorization Act that comes out every year where Congress gives you the money that you need. And I'm sorry, the money, the authorization that you need. The appropriations bills gives you the actual money that you need. And guess what the other resource is? You. <laughs> You're the resource. The National Defense Strategy, whatever it says, is incomplete without you being the means. That's, that's how that functions. So whatever it is that we say we want to accomplish as a state, as a nation, we say, hey, you need to get a more lethal force. We need to, uh, the last one had a, it talked about lethality. Uh, I know this one is going to talk a lot about uh, integrated deterrence. That's going to be really, really key for us, right? So even that, if you get after integrated deterrence, let, how do we do integrated deterrence? So we're going to talk about how we, we get after it, but what's the means to it? It's you. It's you being deliberate about integrating across domains, how you think, taking on new skills, training your people to, to function and, and, and partner with academia and 
uh, other military organizations and entities actually connecting things that aren't generally connected. Your ability and who you are, just remember when you look at strategy, you're the means. So yes, read the national defense strategy. And yes, recognize that your responsibility is to be the means and to develop those means. And those means are the people. It's the thinking that you have. It's the, it's the way you utilize the resources that are ahead of you. When you do that, then you actually are able to achieve it. So I get it. I see why people say, I don't like to talk about strategy because it's not strategy. Because yes, I give you, I'll give the term strategy, but as soon as I don't have the resources, what happens? It affects my ends and ways because I can't get there. That's why we have these frustrations about CR. I, I don't know if many of you are frustrated as enough as you should be about living under continuing resolution, but when you don't get the money that you need or that you said, that was completely based on a strategic calculation that our senior leaders have made. In order to get here, I need this, and this is how we will get there. Give that to me, and we don't get that. So now I have to go back to what I was trying to do and adjust, and I end up shifting the target. So this is the challenge of strategy. All right, so I gave you all of that, that, base, that, that thinking to do this, and, and I apologize. Uh, if that took a long time, but I want you to think about this. <clears throat> what is the China problem? And this time, I want to I want to hear from you guys because here's the um, here's the beautiful part. All of this national defense strategy talk, all of this strategic competition. Maybe you want your uh, you do like in my organization, I was adamant that every single person read the national defense strategy in the unit. I didn't care what they were like. You at least had to read it and have a comprehension about it. So maybe you do that kind of thing in your organization. When you take on the, man, the, the title of chief, the words that come out of your mouth are going to be just as if not more impactful to the people who are under your organization than the words on that document. They're not going to say the national defense strategy says strategic competition is blah, 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 blah. They're going to say, chief said, we need to be focused on this. Chief said, we need to do that. So let's talk about the China problem, chiefs. And let's just walk through, let's hypothetically say, um, from the perspective that Clausewitz would break it down from the Trinity. So that first portion that I mentioned, what's China's policy right now? It, we could do open dialogue. It, it's been mentioned already, but I'm curious. Say it again. I, I, couldn't, I can't hear. Be the, be the world's number one power. Uh, I, I heard it stated differently by them. I think they called it the great rejuvenation. Right? After a hundred years, what they call shame, if you will. A hundred years of shame. Because... Their, again, America's view on history is very like 1700s, everything is, you know, we're so old, that was from the 1700s. China's talking thousands of years when you talk, look at time. And so they say this 100 years is a blip in the, in the history of the Chinese people. This is a blip. This is not who we are. Let's go back to who we should be as a powerhouse, as a state. So their goal is to the great rejuvenation by 2049. That's, a, that's one of, that's a massive policy. Let me ask you this. Do you think that their policy will shift and change? It won't. They don't have, it, it can, but, but do they have the same pressures that, I don't know, hypothetically, like we have in terms of policy? Who, who, who leads the Chinese government? Xi Jinping. Man, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna get rid of him, right? What, how long did he say he was going to have that job? For life. He's not going anywhere. So that policy is going to have stability, which is key for policy. And, and they're going to drive towards it. And that just covers the policy side, side of it. All right, so then let's look at the other side of the, that trinity. The people. Where are the people at? What do you think? Pardon me? They're exactly where they're told to be. I like that. Pardon me? They're a compliance culture. OK. All right, what else? Say that again. 
The government has tremendous influence. Do you remember what we said is how do you control will? That, that was, that's exactly it. Media and information is how you, how you drive your will. And they have locked down the commons and so they control the information that is within their sphere. And that it drives their will. They've just had two movies over the last several years. Their two movies, the two most popular movies in China. In China. Uh, do you think they were like the Avengers or, or like movies like that? No, it is straight up Chinese propaganda. It is about defeating the West. That is, that is, that is completely it. And they did one recently about the chosen, um, the frozen chosen uh, up in uh, North Korea. They did a movie about the battle up there. Completely historically inaccurate about how the Chinese um, won that. But guess what? It doesn't matter. They all went there. The, uh, I say they all. That's a lot of people. It's a billion people. I don't think they all went. But a lot of people went, went there and ate the film, ate, ate it up. So that propaganda, you control the information. Man, you control the will of your people. So if they say we need to do this and it's going to take violence, do you think their people are going to eh, de debate them on that? They quell that kind of thing pretty quick. All right, they, they stomped that. Okay, so that's the people a little bit. What's the last one? The military or chance their ability there. Talk to me about the Chinese military. No bureaucracy. <laughs> no, they have limited bureaucracy. Their structure is, is different. What else? They have the means. They have the means. Say, somebody else said it as well. You said something about spending? They've increased their spending, absolutely. And they're doing it smartly. You know what I love about it? How they, they do things so much cheaper. You know why our, one of the things that makes uh, our defense budget so expensive? is because we have to design things. You know how much R&D costs? But not if you're China. I'm stealing that shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'd be like, I, I don't care. I'm just stealing it. I'm taking it. It's mine. And, 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 and then, so you lose all, all of, so here we are investing in the genius and the design and all of that. It comes with time. You just come in and, and steal it, claim it. That, that's a totally different dynamic that you have yourself with. So th that's one aspect of their military. So let's talk, let's just go back to that concept of um, their strategy. All right, so their strategy, their ends, their ways, means you kind of connected, you guys already connected that. It's gonna to be tied to this here, and somebody mentioned it already. The Belt and Road Initiative. So you guys are tracking the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm sure you've all heard about it. I don't wanna drag it through the, the mud, but I'll just tell you, this is one thing that kind of stood out to me. Can I just give you like my moment of enlightenment on the Belt and Road Initiative? So, you know, this is a massive economic um, undertaking that, that China's doing is going to take them into uh, West Europe. And economically, man, they, they are going it, to, it's, it's going to just go gangbusters in terms of their ability to control commerce in that area. And he, here's a little side note. Uh, if you want to know why the dollar in English language is so popular, it's because uh, we trade so aggressively with countries that that's one of the reasons that, that the English language and the dollar is so prevalent because it is the language of commerce. I just want to say, at some point in time, when the yen and Mandarin become the, the language of commerce, we're going to find ourselves, our, our, maybe our kids' kids will be in schools learning a different language so that they can be effective in the future economy, if that makes sense. We're in, we're, we may be in a situation watching that, that transition. But here's the thing about this China problem that I think is interesting with, their, um, with the Belt and Road Initiative. Because many of you are not in, you know, maybe you're like, dang, we're so focused on China, China, China. What about my theater? How does that impact my theater? You know, what are the other actors doing? Okay, well, so here's an example. Uh, let's think about this. There's a couple different ports or a couple places that the Belt and Road Initiative is going to stop off on its way to, you know, over to Western Europe. And two of them really stand out in my brain. One of them is Tehran, and the other one is Moscow and in Istanbul and so forth, but Tehran and Moscow, that really stands out to me for some reason. So, and, and here's why. Those happen to be countries that the U.S. does not necessarily agree with them ideologically. We've got tons of, of issues in terms of, particularly Iran, they're, they're uh, fomenting, you know, 
um, Islam, uh, extremism in the region, the tensions with Israel, all of the things. What is the mechanism that we have been using to try to engage with Iran generally? Do, do you guys know what's the prime thing? What is it? Sanctions. So how effective will sanctions be when the Belt and Road Initiative is in play? And there is very little, if any, requirement for them to engage with us from that perspective. Damn. <laughs> you closed the door on that one. <laughs> but so how effective will that be? It's going to become harder. So if you limit, if you lost one of your opportunities, if you lost one of the aspects of dime that you use for global power, because now economically you don't have the ability to use sanctions to try to, to try to drive or try to work behavior, you find yourself with limited options in how you're going to respond to a country that has the potential to begin to act more aggressive to their neighbors. Because they have less checks and balances, there's less at risk for them because now they have a backer or a supporter in China. And I say a backer, it's loose because China views relationships with other countries very differently than we do. Okay, here's a quick example of how China views relations, not an example, but a, um, a way to think about it. China builds transactional relationships with countries, and America builds transformative relationships with countries. If you are going to engage with America, it's transformative in nature, meaning that there's certain norms and behaviors and things that we're going to look for. Does human rights matter to you? I can't be giving you um, the head of state of Nigeria or, or, um, or Uganda or Rwanda. I can't be giving you all of these supplies and weapons knowing that you're violating human rights in your own country because America's values travel with our money. So it becomes very transformative in the way that we relate with other states. China is transactional. You give me this or we'll take that. You give me this, you, we take that. And that's a really fascinating way that they have used colonialism across Africa, but they're doing it with other states as well. But again, if they're deciding and they're deliberately choosing non-Western, non-democratic states to align with and build these transactional relationships, those states r run a much higher risk in the future of responding to us or to their environment using violence, knowing that they have a backer that does not care about how they respond or how they act. So the Belt and Road Initiative is not just about Chinese prosperity. It's actually about bringing prosperity to some of our adversaries and challengers, Moscow. You, you, you think that without, have, without the tightness of the relationship between Putin and, uh, uh, and China, they would be doing what they're doing in Ukraine right now? Absolutely not. So we would have sanctioned them. China would have been like, yeah, we have to sanction them as well. And that would have changed that dynamic. So what happens? They begin to act more boldly, more erratic. Uh, and so if you want to see global instability, or at least instability to the existing world order for which we said is our policy to defend, this stands against that. This is a massive challenge to it. So what is our solution? We're going to build alliances and friends across the country, across the world. That's what we're going to use, at least as a state. Again, I'm at the geostrategic point. This is about building relationships and connections. I know the words are small for you guys, but can you guys see what that says? China, these are countries that China is the largest world trade, and the other one is the countries where the US is the largest trading partner. Now, it's not, a, it's not a numbers, you know, I'm less interested in the 124 and the 56, and this is dated, so that this, is, this may have changed a bit. But I am interested in who the partners are. Who, who are the partners? So, you know who our number one ally when we go to, um, we've been in any armed conflict has been? Like, who's, who's our, I, I, I think of them like a ride or die. Like, if we're going in, you know what country is our ride or die? Like, they coming with us? Australia. Australia's in it. Like, Australia's like, hey, what, what do you need? We're there, mate. <laughs> and so here's the, here's the deal with Australia. Number one trading partner. Like, they don't want that smoke. As, as, if you look at what's going to potentially could happen with Taiwan, Ch Australia doesn't want that smoke there. They don't want the smoke on there uh, uh, locally. But at, at the same time, they don't want to see a rising China because they know that that threatens them. So they're in this precarious situation where they will support us up until a point. 
and that becomes the dilemma of this transactional relationship that China's built with everybody, is the people that you, you are expecting to depend on to help you to slow the rise of China or their Belt and Road Initiative are economically intertwined with China to a point where it becomes complicated to know that we can actually uh, trust or count on our allies, which is one of the reasons that you'll see it's such a priority for us to do everything we can to strengthen our alliances, strengthen our military alliances, strengthen our relationships with those teammates. Does that make sense? All right. I lost my clicker. So with that being said, I know what from this conversation that we've had uh, a little bit, and, I, and, and I'm, if you guys have questions, discussions, let's challenge things. This is what I want to do, and I'll tell you um, why in a second. I talked a lot about who we are and then a bit about our adversary. And this is Sun Tzu because this is how, how, how they think. They've been studying us for a long time. They've been sending their, their, their people to our universities and getting educated in, in American culture and history. And they are, they, are, they are well beyond us in terms of their knowledge and understanding about who we are, what our values are, and what the trigger points are for the American people. We have a lot of catching up to do. And if you want to win, no matter what that looks like, you have to know yourself. And that's why it took some time for us to just reflect on who we are and, and, and maybe some of the challenges that we have. And you also have to know your enemy. What matters to them? What are their values? And what is of interest to them? And when you, have both, when you understand both of those things, your potential for success is far, far greater than before. Sound good? All right, so the last thing I want, I want to do is, when I think about strategic competition and this, it's really your why. <laughs> if you understand this, this is why you do the things you do. And so if you haven't seen this, I'm going to share it with you real quick because this to me is a poignant message. This is called, online. how do I know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just gonna show you the clip, check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That bro could sing, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. Oh, 
So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Something about like uh, being a black guy introducing a clip of a black guy who introduces a clip of himself is so meta that I, I love it. Um, <laughs> but, but ho ho I mean, I'm sure some of you guys have seen that before, but I, the message to me is that's, that completely connects to this idea of strategic competition and what we're really talking about is understanding why. You have so many things that you're being asked to do or change or function in and it's, happening, and it's happening at a rapid rate. And many of you know exactly what you need to do. I know what I need to do. And you're telling your airmen, and, and they're asking you why. Take the time to explain why. Take the time to internalize the why. Why does this matter? Because, uh, not just because someone says, because China. No, get to a deeper level of understanding about what that means and how that's going to change the, world, uh, the, the global world order and how that will impact our children's children and, and how that is going to potentially drive up other adversaries, not China, to behave differently and impact our relationships with our allies and friends and so forth all over the globe. This understanding your why changes how you behave in the very thing you're doing right now. And that's what we need our, our people to do, is to think more aggressively to try to solve the big problems that we have. Sound good? All right, so that's what I had. Uh, I like, I don't know if there's, we got to, questions or comments or debate. Here, uh, if I can give you one homework assignment um, for why you guys leave, um, and this was my beef as a, as a chief sometimes, is I, I used to come to conferences like this after I made chief and went to them for uh, many, many years with Chief Bass and so forth. And you know, I made this, I, I had this mistake. So many of you don't make this mistake. I would show up and I would be like the angry, uh, angry chief, just like I was an angry tech sergeant. I have this thing about tech sergeants. They're the angriest group of people on the planet. Um, <laughs> It, it, I, it just, it's not debatable, tech sergeants. Look at them, they're, they're angry. Uh, and then, but then there's chiefs, and chiefs are like some of the most ornery people to try to work with. And I used to sit back there at these conferences, and I was ornery too, because I had this chip on my shoulder that I used to say, man, we sit here and we talk about leadership, leadership, leadership. Leadership, leadership, leadership. Everyone is warm and fuzzy in leadership, and how you do this, and how you do that, and leadership, leadership, leadership. And I was like, I got it, we're good leaders. But if we lose the next war, Bruh, what's it for? I don't care, and I didn't say that, and I don't mean to be that way. I don't care that we're the world's best. We're not a leader development organization. We're a war fighting organization. We have a mandate by the American people to defend America, to defend our interests on the globe. Yes, as a part of that process, we build great leaders. As a part of that process, we develop human beings to become better members of society. But you know what your primary function is based on what you're wearing on your chest? It's to defend this country. It's to be thinking about the problems that we just talked about and how we can solve them at your level. That's the part that matters to me. So I used to be one of those guys that sit there and be frustrated. Like, Man. And then uh, uh, I get a call from the chief master on the Air Force and it's like, hey, you used to complain about it. I come and talk about it. It's like, damn. <laughs> All right. So here I am. <laughs> All right, so questions? I'll leave it one. Hey, hey, go ahead. Today we got 30 minutes for lunch, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Man. Am I into you their lunch time, period? But if you're going to stick around a little bit. Hey, I'm here, I'm here all week. But So here was my last homework assignment. When you guys are, are having your side conversations, man, talk about some of this stuff. Talk about how you're going to try to defeat China. Don't just allow it to just be simply focused on, you know, oh, the, the, I'm complaining about the EES system or complaining about that. Those things are important. But make a part of your, your conversations among each other about, hey, here's how my organization can get better, more efficient, more effective, more lethal, um, and how we can integrate better for the purpose of integrated deterrence. Hey, thank you guys for your time. I much appreciate you. Cool.